Welcome, everybody. I'm Millie Solomon, president of the Hastings Center. And this is the fourth in our new series called Hastings Conversations. Every two months, we feature one of the research projects that are going on here at our institute in Garrison, New York, or a publication from one of our two journals. And our goal in creating Hastings Conversations is to give you a window in on the issues our scholars are studying and analyzing and about which they write and speak. And today, we're going to focus on a recent report on player health in the National Football League and the role of club physicians. Those are the doctors who are employed by the NFL to care for players. The report found that there are structural conflicts of interest what in bioethics we might call problems of dual agency, in that the club doctors are employed by the NFL, but they're also responsible for player health. So these physicians may experience divided loyalties that could imperil player health. We were very proud to publish a portion of the report as a special supplement to our journal, the Hastings Center Report. And the supplement included the report as well as a set of essays or commentaries that we solicited from a wide variety of other relevant stakeholders, including inviting a response from the Club Physicians Membership Society itself. The primary report was authored by a team of Harvard faculty at the prestigious Petri Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. With us today is the lead author and the director of the Petri Flom Center, my friend and my colleague, Professor Glenn Cohen. Glenn, I'm about to embarrass you. Um, oh, no. Listeners, <laughs> listeners should know that Glenn is one of the world's leading experts on the intersection of bioethics and the law. He speaks at conferences around the world, and he's appeared on or been covered in many major media outlets, from PBS to CNN, from the New York Times to the New Republic. Today's discussion with Glenn is an invitation-only phone call um, for friends of the Hastings Center, those of you who are particularly interested in closer contact with our work or our scholars. However, we are going to be recording this and posting it on the Hastings YouTube channel. I'm going to chat with Glenn for about the first 20 minutes of the call, and then we'll open it up and invite those of you who are listening in to ask questions. For now, I'd like you all to mute your phones so that we won't have any background noise. So I'll give you a second to do that. Glenn, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, I know that your report is part of a larger effort that was undertaken and still going on at Harvard University, which received a major grant from the NFL Players Association. The larger grant includes funds for medical research on many aspects of player health, uh, including but not limited to concussions and neurologic injuries. At Petri Flom, you've taken on responsibility for looking at the legal and ethical issues related to protecting NFL players. I'm wondering, in addition to the need for medical research is pretty obvious, but how is it that you anticipated that there would also be legal and ethical concerns? And, and what did you, um, what sorts of concerns did you foresee? Thanks so much, Millie. And first of all, let me say how grateful I am to the Hastings Center for this partnership. You know, when I was young and starting out in bioethics, like, you know, the Hastings Center, the idea that I would ever work with the Hastings Center was kind of a dream. So it's just thrilling uh, to have gotten to know you and other people at the center. Um, you know, so let me just take one step back, which is to say this, uh, the money that the National Football League Players Association has spent on uh, player health and is funding this work comes from the 2011 collective bargaining agreement between the National Football League and the Players Association. So we really think of it as the players' money and think of ourselves as custodians of this money and stewards, wise stewards about how to spend it. As you say, um, this large research project has uh, medical pieces, uh, a cohort study, a population study of all former players that we can recruit to understand their health, and also funding for pilot uh, interventions like new forms of ACL repair or tau imaging and the like. So why have this third bucket of money for legal and ethical work? Well, I think two reasons. The first is uh, there are things that have come up and will come up as part of the actual medical research that require the expertise of bioethicists. 
in particular issues result relating to results return. And here there are many uh, interesting and difficult questions about returning results uh, in uh, an area of uncertainty uh, and thinking about how to communicate that information to players and to their families when we're in an era of uh, extreme media coverage of these topics. The other bucket of money, though, is to say outside of the medical research we're doing, uh, what should we be focusing on that's important to player health? And our report, uh, this massive report that we did, about 493 pages, really was an attempt to look at all stakeholders who have a role in player health. So we mapped 20 stakeholders. And some of these are obvious, like the players themselves, the NFL clubs, uh, the team doctors. But many others were much less obvious. So contract advisors, financial advisors, fans, the media, business partners like Nike, for example. And the idea was what can the, the methods and ideas from bioethics really help us understand what the responsibilities of these players are, uh, to these players are from these stakeholders, and how uh, the activity of these stakeholders can be harnessed and really improved to further player health. So that's one bucket of projects. We also, though, have been looking at other things. We just had a paper come out on Tuesday looking at actually uh, the law and ethics of employment discrimination. So uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act and the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, uh, they apply to all workplaces. And on our analysis, they apply to the NFL as a workplace as well. Uh, so uh, for example, you're not supposed to, under the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, ask somebody about family history. Is it a problem if that goes on as part of the draft process in the NFL and as part of the regular kind of decisions that have been made as a business matter? There are also ethical issues involved about how much transparency and disclosure players should have to have about their health uh, to the clubs. Uh, this is a business, but there's questions about the right way to balance it. So those are some of the other things we're doing. We're also working on a qualitative research project with researchers at Hastings actually being led, I think it's fair to say, uh, by Sarah McGraw at Hastings, which is a listening tour of the experiences of former players and their families, to really hear it in their own words. And that's some ongoing work that we're doing. I have to say that here at the Hastings Center, when you gave us the opportunity to participate in this way, um, Sarah was uh, the lucky person who's visiting all of these players in their homes and, and chatting with them about their health, and including mental health and social issues. So it's, this is an, an exciting part of the project that we aren't going to focus on for this call, but there will be a series of papers that Sarah McGraw will be working on with Glenn and his team at Harvard. So. Uh, You've, you've just sketched out a very large array of ethical issues and, and that, you, that you had the clairvoyance to foresee as you were developing the proposal with the NFLPA. And one of the most important issues that you've, you identified was the potential for divided loyalty within club physicians who have obligations both to the NFL and to the players. So that's what we recently published. And I wondered if you could start just by filling us all in about the current role of club doctors, who they are, how's their role structured, and, and why is that a problem? Great. Yeah, I also want to just acknowledge my co-authors in all this work, uh, Chris Dubert and Holly Fernandez-Lynch, who are co-equal partners with me on this. So um, let me start by saying that we have the utmost respect for these people who are uh, team doctors. Many of them are excellent uh, doctors, club doctors, many of them who are excellent uh, physicians. Uh, but the problem that we see, and it's really the medical staff, so it's both the club doctors and the athletic trainers, is we think that they've been put in an extremely difficult situation that we call structural conflict of interest, but as you say in bioethics, maybe more commonly known as a problem of dual loyalty. So what's the problem? The problem is that these uh, club doctors have really two very different roles. One is to uh, evaluate the players and make recommendations from a business perspective to the club. The other is to offer treatment to these players. So they diagnose and treat players for a variety of ailments, physical and mental, while making recommendations to the players concerning those elements. But at the same time, they have obligations to the club to inform and advise the club about the health status of players. And while sometimes there's overlap in these two functions, right? Uh, there is a joint interest in making sure players are healthy, can play at the best peak performance. There's also areas of divergence. And we find those areas of divergence to be uh, problematic. And we think none of the parties, the clubs, the players, or the club doctors should uh, prefer this. And again, I want to be clear here that the practical impact of these conflicts probably varies from club to club, depending on the club's approach to player health, the amount of autonomy given to the medical staff. 
But we think that as long as a doctor is required to wear both of those hats, the conflict is essentially unavoidable. And some doctors may be better able to negotiate the conflict better than others, but in general, if you're going to set up a system that's going to require heroic moral and professional judgment in the face of a systemic structural conflict of interest, we think that's one bound to fail. We also think that this contributes to distrust of uh, the team doctors. And in our report, uh, both the Long Report but also the Hastings Center, uh, we quote some players we spoke to who expressed exactly those concerns, right? That they want to trust the doctors, they like the doctor, but they're worried about this flow of information. They're worried about whether the doctor's always acting in their best interest. And uh, again, this is not a moral indictment of these club doctors, but a moral indictment of the system in which they've been put in place. And I draw the analogy to what we do for organ donation. So in organ donation, uh, we always require two separate care, care teams, one to care for the dying patient and pronounce them dead, and one to conduct the transplant and care for the recipient. We're worried that if a single medical team served both roles, there'd be a problem of dual loyalty, be a very difficult situation, and in particular, be worried that patients would not, who are, you know, agreeing to undergo transplant at the end of their life, would be worried that someone would take their organs early or the like. We've just decided it's much better to have this separation. And what we recommend in the report is uh, a similar separation. We think that we ought to have two distinct roles staffed by uh, two a distinct set of doctors, right? Uh, and what's interesting, I think, and I'm happy to say more about the, the details, is Tom Murray, uh, President Emeritus of the Hastings Center in 1984, kind of recognized exactly this similar problem and laid out sort of a set of possible solutions. And we think of ourselves as really uh, developing one of the possible solutions he uh, suggests uh, in that 1984 seminal article. Thanks, Glenn. That, I was unaware of that connection to Tom. That's very gratifying, and I will be sure to pass that on to him. Um, I wish I had known that. That's terrific. So what, how have people reacted? And I don't mean just people in general. How have the Players Association reacted? How have the club doctors, the NFL itself, what kinds of responses are you getting? Yeah, so you know, let me just say a little bit more about the proposal first, which is to say our proposal is that basically player care and treatment should be provided by one set of uh, uh, medical professionals. We call them the player's medical staff. They should be appointed by a joint committee with representation from the NFL itself and the NFLPA, and then have a separate set of medical staff, evaluation of players for business purposes. So that would be their job. And you know, we, we go into some detail both in the report and in the Hastings Center Special Supplement about how this would work. Uh, what we would do to ensure that there's not a loss of information and the like. Uh, so we think that this is a good proposal. In fact, we lay out a spectrum of possible forms of uh, bifurcation, some that are more total than what we do and some that are less total than what we do. And I should say that we think of what we're doing here is beginning and having a conversation that we desperately want to have. No proposal is perfect. We think the refinements are possible. But we think this is the right direction to go. So in terms of responses, uh, I think it's interesting. So I'll tell you about a few of the responses. One, in the special supplement itself, Ross McKinney, who's a prominent bioethicist and a consultant for the NFLPA, he writes a commentary called, Being Right Isn't Always Enough, colon, NFL Culture and Team Positions Conflict of Interest. And, you know, this is, I think, uh, Dr. McKinney speaking on his personal capacity. I don't think he's speaking for the PA itself. But the thrust of it is basically that he thinks this proposal makes a lot of sense. He thinks it does the right thing ethically. He thinks it's a good idea. But he says, uh, and I'm, you know, the, the problem with it is that, uh, like most sports teams, football works in a hierarchical model. Military terms like command and control resonate in football. Indeed, they're accepted as part of the code of the sport. The coach rules, the players follow. And within the culture, there's a generally accepted understanding that control is critical. So his view, which is correct, I think, would be that they would find a lot of resistance to the proposal uh, from the NFL and from the Physician Society, and our initial interactions with them were essentially along those lines. So I want to say I'm grateful that the NFL read our proposal. I'm grateful that they gave us comments on it. So, you know, they had that level of interaction. And then after it, we invited them to write a response. Uh, they wrote a 33-page response letter, which is uh, publicly available. We have a response to the response. You can read it. Uh, but I'll say that both they and the National Football League Players Society, uh, Football Physician Society, who also wrote a response in the special supplement, 
Uh, their view is that uh, the uh, conflict of interest we have identified is not a conflict. It's theoretical. It's theorized. And uh, in fact, there's no problem here, right? So that's kind of their uh, first kind of response. Unsurprisingly, we disagree, uh, as do most of the people who commented in this special supplement. Um, Mark Rothstein, uh, Art Kaplan, all these other people, and also in the media, lots of disagreement as well. Um, you know, Steve Joffe at Penn said, you know, it's remarkable that they would deny that this is the case. Um, uh, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, in a blog with Bill Simmons, uh, basically said, you know, uh, if the NFL is so confident, the NFL lawyers are so confident uh, about the lack of a conflict of interest, well, maybe they should allow, uh, when they're negotiating for their next job, maybe they should allow the company's lawyer to negotiate for them and read the documents and the like, and other people too, players as well. So I think the response has been really of one of two dimensions, and it's a little funny. One is to say, Duh is the first response that say this is incredibly obvious. How could anybody deny that this is a problem? And we're glad you did the work, and we're glad you thought about objections, and we're glad that you you know you kind of searched the literature. But it's remarkable that anybody would deny that there's a structural conflict of interest. And the others basically have what I would characterize as total denial, and basically say there's no problem here. And I think it's a bit of a uh, an error in not understanding what a structural conflict of interest is, and wanting instead evidence. Uh, that the structural conflict of interest has caused specific problems. So those have been the two, I would say, modal responses. Of course you're right, or what, 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 what the heck are you thinking? But my hope is, over time, as there's more media discussion and more kind of, and the NFL and other parties have some time to kind of read and think and ruminate on this, my hope is we're going to get to a place where we're a little bit closer to getting to yes, where we're going to be, instead of just denying there's a structural conflict of interest, saying, yeah, this is not ideal. Yeah, this is a problem. And start thinking about what we might do to tweak to get us to a better place. Thanks, Glenn. Um, I know Art Kaplan didn't think you went far enough. Why not? What did he want you to That's do? That's right. Yeah, so what's interesting, you know, I think it might have been Churchill to say, you know, maybe you're in the right position when <laughs> both, you're getting it a little bit from both sides. So mm -hmm. Art, you know, in a very genteel uh, sort of way, I think his view was that there should be no physician, you know, like he read, read his great piece, speaks for itself. But I think yeah. Art would want a more total bifurcation than we would. So basically he'd want every uh, player to simply see a personal physician and have a personal physician uh, kind of treat him and mm -hmm. not have essentially any physicians that are in any way really affiliated with the club uh, or the league involved in the system. And I think, you know, where we differ from art on this is that we kind of uh, acknowledge that clubs do have some legitimate business interest in the health of the players, that this is not a case where uh, the club is indifferent or ought to be uh, morally indifferent. So we think that the evaluation function is something that we can understand why the clubs want to have that. What we want to, though, be careful about is not to mix the streams and to make sure that there is a truly independent uh, voice making treating decisions. And one thing I'll say that, uh, just to return to the, the earlier point that surprised us, I think, about the NFL's response, is that when it comes to concussions, uh, in fact, the NFL has essentially adopted our solution. They have an unaffiliated neurotrauma consultant making the calls who's not affiliated with either team and is truly independent. So it's our hope that we can say, listen, you decided that this is a big enough issue, this conflict of interest for concussions. We want you to extend it to the whole player uh, and all of his medical ailments, not just here. But Art, I think, thinks that even allowing the evaluation function is problematic and would want a total bifurcation. We're a little bit worried, and this is par partially due to our uh, experience in talking to individual players and their interactions with healthcare workers. We're a little worried about whether they would be able to get ready and constant advice from personal physicians and the logistics of that as well. But that, you know, that is, uh, I think, art's kind of position. Yeah, thank you. That's, that's, that's very interesting. And yeah, you may well be in exactly the right spot since both sides think <laughs> there should be something else going on. Um, you know, I'm wondering, Glenn, since it's now, there's so much news about the dangers of concussions and the danger of the sport, um, very prominently, people are becoming aware of this. Why didn't Petri Flom weigh in on the overall 
safety and wisdom of football? That's a great question. So uh, in a, uh, the report itself, and we also did a frequently asked questions report, this is a question we got asked a lot, so we gave it some thought. Uh, I think one element of this is just to say that we are talking here about adult men making decisions for themselves. And we're, uh, um, you know, I think big believers that we want to empower people to make good decisions, but perhaps not take the decisions away from them. So we talk in our uh, Hastings Center Special Settlement and the report about a notion of empowered autonomy. We're not just, you know, uh, as American bioethics is sometimes being characterized as just rah, rah, rah autonomy. I don't think we're in that camp. Instead, we're uh, about thinking about the structures in which decisions are being made. And that's not just the need to give information, but present information in a way that's understandable to this population, relevant to them, to have family members involved in informing and making the decisions, uh, and to think about transparency and the need to share up-to-date information. So that's one piece of it, is that I think that our preference as a group, and I speak for myself here, but I think the three of us, is that we are believers that ultimately uh, there are decisions that belong to adult men about how they, what risks they undertake or not. We have an obligation to minimize the risks, but uh, beyond a certain point, there is also a certain amount of uh, autonomy individuals should have in making that decision. So that's one piece of it. The other is just to say that I think it's an extremely complicated uh, question, right? Uh, among other things, if football were to go away, uh, what sports would some of these people shift to? What are the risks involved in those sports? Almost certainly less than football, uh, but how do we think about that? Um, if football were to go away, what is the lifetime welfare of some of the individuals who play it, right? What do their lives look like at a counterfactual where football is not available to them? Would we uh, end football just at the professional level or uh, end it uh, at the Pop Warner or earlier level? What effect would that have on communities? What effect would that have on the ability to enter college and the like? So it's not so much that I think we have a definitive position on this as to think it's incredibly complicated and we have no special expertise in answering this question as bioethicists. So we don't recommend that. Uh, I think even among the three of us, we may have different uh, feelings uh, about, uh, about this, about where we, we fall on the spectrum on this. But the report itself certainly doesn't take a position that football should be ended. Instead, what we're seeking to do is to improve the lives of players within uh, American football, uh, you know, changes to be made, absolutely, but this particular report is not focused on whether the sport should be ended. Great. It's really clear that you very gracefully and um, analytically navigated the, t the inherent tension between the principle of harm reduction, wanting to reduce harms, and the principle of, of, of that adults have the right to self-determination, which includes the right to take risks. Um, I'm going to open this up now to the floor. Um, for questions. Since um, we can't see one another, there's no body language to think signal, so just jump in. But please um, remember to unmute your phone and give, if you're the speaker, and give your name first. So do we have a question? Hi, uh, this is Brad Gray. Um, very, very interesting uh, discussion. Um, I am uh, curious, uh, in, under your proposal with the, t with the, t the two uh, sets of uh, medical professionals, about the extent to which there would be shared medical records? Would they, they all be operating from the same record, or would, they, would there be separation there? So great questions. Let me give a little bit more, more detail to try to answer that, right? So again, we have these two teams, the players' medical staff, who's appointed by a joint committee with representation from the NFL and the PA, and we have the club evaluation doctors. Um, there would only be one group of professionals treating the players. Treat players would only be treated by the player's medical staff, which would have the player's interest as their sole consideration, right? They have the same access to players and clubs as they currently do, and they'd be present during practices and games for the same number of hours as they currently are. Uh, they would not provide care based solely on a health report, but would be responsible for creating a report to provide to the club for its business use. And the club evaluation doctor would utilize the player health report and his or her own examination of the player to assist the club with its business decisions. So the idea here would be, uh, I think there would be, uh, the, the treating physicians would have the full access to all the information that they've been gathering under the status quo. But there would be some reduction in information provided to the evaluation physicians. And this would be in the form of a player health report. That's what we sort of envision here. 
Thank you. Okay, great. Any other questions? Hi, this is Frank Trainer. Um, this issue reminds me a little bit of voter ID, where the logic for requiring it seems obvious, but the argument against it says there's no issue here, there's no proof of a problem. Have you done much work on how much of a real problem there is? Yeah, this is a great question. So the first thing is the question is how you define the problem will help you determine how much of a problem it is, right? So. If the question is players' trust, do players trust their physician? Uh, in the report, again, we talk to many players, we quote some of them, but it's not uh, designed, this part of the project is not designed as qualitative research such that uh, this is a, a sampling methodology or something like that. I will tell you many of the players we spoke to expressed concerns about, and trust about the current system, as did many of the players who spoke out after our report was released. The Associated Press also in 2016 did a survey, more scientific, again, so small and of 100 current NFL players. When asked whether NFL teams, coaches, and team doctors have players' best interest in mind when it comes to injuries and player health, 47 players said yes, but 39 said no, and 14 players were either unsure or refused to respond, and the numbers got worse for trust as players were more experienced when you looked at the who uh, was more experienced. So this is some evidence that there is a significant concern and trust uh, issue here. There have been some allegations in some cases by players that the uh, treatment they received was not uh, what they should have received and that that was related to these kinds of issues, but those are allegations of people on the back end. I think for me the best form of evidence I can give people uh, is really just a, a question of kind of introspection, right? Um, ask yourself, would you be content if tomorrow I were to wave a wand and change the current way you receive health care? Most of us receive health care from a physician who is not uh, serving, paid for, evaluated, fired by our employer. If tomorrow I were just to wave a wand and put you under that system, right, would that be a good thing in your mind or not? Would you prefer a system like that or would you have concerns? And our view is while there are things that make the NFL special in terms of the right to have uh, a physician you can trust and one who does not labor under structural conflict of interest, there's no reason why NFL players deserve less than the rest of us. Thank you, Glenn. Another question, and thank you, Frank and Brad, for those questions. They were very, very good. Any other questions? We have a couple minutes left. Uh, hi, Millie. This is Ramzi. I, I have a question, actually. Do these uh, teams ever get any auditing done? I mean, does anybody audit what the doctors do? Is, is there any any function like that? I mean, this may be simplistic coming from somebody who's from different background, but I'm just kind of interested in that. Yeah, there's some um, review. So the NFL Physician Society, I think they discussed this a little bit in their reply. Uh, they uh, uh, have some review function and ability to um, uh, censure, I think, their members, members of, the, of these club doctors. Um, I think I have to look, look back and see whether there's any information. I believe we may have asked them whether anybody's ever been censured. I don't remember whether we got the answer no or we didn't get an answer on that. I'd have to go back uh, and look it up. Um, uh, the, there is a credentialing process for club physicians, right, in terms of what certifications they have and the like. And the clubs themselves are uh, presumably constantly evaluating whether to retain these club doctors or the like. I think the big change that we recommend is that instead they be selected by a committee with joint representation of the union, who's representing the players, and uh, the NFL, and that there'd be a more regular process like that. But I don't want to suggest that there's no uh, process. I mean, even just as physicians in America, they are uh, by definition kind of subject to the usual requirements and, and the usual review statuses. I, we Thanks. are. Draw thank you very much for that question, Ramsey. We're we're drawing to a close. Um, I want to thank you, Glenn. I see this issue as part of the broader issue of professional ethics, the roles and responsibilities of professionals, either doctors but also lawyers and journalists specialized groups with special knowledge 
who get special perks in our society, but in exchange for special obligations. And I think you and I have talked about how professional societies play a critically important mediating role in building public trust. And we know historically that professional groups can be recruited by commercial interests or even by the state for both good and bad reasons. Um, I don't want to exaggerate, but we know what's happened in the early 20th century when physicians became co-opted and played a huge role in, um, in the eugenics mu movement. So this is a tiny um, aspect of that. It's small, but it's very important. But I do see it as a kind of seamless part of this larger question of how do we best ensure the trustworthiness of the professions and the critical role they play in, as mediators of a, of a free society. I don't know if you want if you have a final comment you would want to make on that, and then I'm just going to say goodbye to everybody and let them know a little bit about the next Hastings conversation. Do you think that's an exaggeration, I, Glenn? Or yeah? No, I, I think that's exactly right. I just want to amplify what you said, Billy, and that sometimes these influences are quite subtle. But if we think we'll take what we've learned about pizza lunches and pens from pharmaceutical companies and how it alters prescribing patterns, right? Uh, that sometimes it's easy to see. Sometimes the wolf comes as a wolf, and it's easy to see, but sometimes the wolf is in sheep clothing. And I just want to say how grateful we are to be able to work with the Hastings Center on these topics. Thank you, Glenn. It's a, it's a pleasure. So I want to announce to all of you who are on the phone that our next Hastings conversation is going to be uh, also very topical. We're going to be focusing on the underlying ethical issues and underlying values that we want to preserve as our nation repeals the Affordable Care Act. What should we be looking for in whatever comes next um, from an ethics point of view? It won't be a detailed policy wonkish conversation, but it will be a much more um, foundational conversation about what values we think should be um, embodied in whatever comes, whatever is coming. Uh, the date for that will be set very soon, and we'll let everyone on this call know about it. And um, if you'd like the full report and haven't received it, then just send me an email, and we'll make sure it gets to you. And if you want to get in touch with Glenn, let me know, and I'll, I'll try to connect you. Glenn, thank you so much. This was really terrific. We so appreciated your taking the time to join us. Thank and you thank all. You all. And thank you all for calling in. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.